regular lectures and seminars. It's my privilege to welcome you also to our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who are joining us on our Heritage.org website. I would ask everyone in-house to make that last courtesy check that cell phones have been turned off as we proceed with the program and recording of this event. Our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing them to us at speaker at heritage.org. And we will post the program within 24 hours on our Heritage website for everyone's future reference. <coughs> Introducing our special guest this morning is Walter Lohman. Mr. Lohman serves as director of our Asian Studies Center. He previously served as Senior Vice President and Executive Director of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council for four years. During the late 1990s, he was the Council's Senior Country Director, representing American interests in Singapore and Indonesia. In 2002, he served as a senior, uh, senior professional Republican staff member advising former Senator Jesse Helms. And from 91 to 96, he also served as a foreign policy aide to <coughs> Senator John McCain. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Walter Lennon. Walter. Well, why Indonesia? I mean, every, country, every country in Washington has an embassy here. Why single out Indonesian ambassadors to come over and speak in heritage? I think it's a fair question and actually one that I've heard in the hallway around here uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, Indonesia, because it's the fourth largest country in the world, the heart of ASEAN, and let's face it, without Indonesia, there wouldn't be no ASEAN. There would be no reason for it to exist. Uh, it's the largest Muslim majority country in the world and the third largest democracy. Uh, and all of them know those well known facts. But they are facts, and they're, they're big, important facts. Uh, for these reasons and others, uh, several years ago, when Heritage was developing our American Leadership Program, uh, we singled out Indonesia as the best candidate for the United States to build a partnership with beyond its five treaty allies in the region. <coughs> Indonesia jumped quickly to the top of that list of possible candidates, and we were glad to ramp up our effort in Indonesia. So that's why Indonesia today. Now, I will say it's also true that Ambassador Jalal and I have been talking about doing this for a few months. Uh, it started out as part of a broader session on ASEAN, um, and some of you may remember my announcing to, uh, to this group that we would do something um, associated with ASEAN and invite the ambassador over to do it. But then Nina called me and said, hey, Walt, I have another idea. Uh, check out the speech I gave at Stanford. Uh, just recently called Eight Things You Need to Know to Survive in the 21st Century. Um, it sounded more like a business guru type of speech to me <laughs> than, a, than a, a political science speech or a diplomat speech. And that political science speech side of me was telling me um, that I should stick to something much more bland. I don't mean important, mind you, but, but safe. Um, but Dino's an ambassador now, so I said yes. <laughs> and then I watched the speech. Um, it struck me, watching this speech at Stanford, that getting outside of the age of policy comfort zone is exactly what this town needs. Instead of hearing about Indonesia's plans for ASEAN, and i got to tell you, as much as I'm happy to see Indonesia in the chair, the plans don't sound that much different from every other chair of ASEAN, and at the end of the year, it's probably not going to be that big a difference in the way ASEAN runs. So instead of that, how about a program featuring an up-and-coming Indonesian leader and his thoughts on the future of the world and, and how to get along in, in the new world we're facing. Uh, what a better insight, actually, uh, into the current Indonesian frame of mind. So it was a great idea, and lucky for me because I had already agreed to it. Uh, now, Dino, um, his speech at Stanford was also peppered with the P word, which he talked about progressive. Uh, he clearly means it, I think, as a synonym for modern or advanced. I'm trying to explain to him what it means here at Heritage. <laughs> <laughs> here it's actually much bigger even than politics. This is a place where we regularly reference the election of 1912. And it's the only place in D.C., I think, and I'm proud to say that routine, routinely sings the praises of Calvin Coolidge. So Dino and I have talked about that. I have to admit I'm eagerly, actually nervously, kind of waiting to hear how he handles it. Before coming to Washington last year as Ambassador, Ambassador Jalal served as Special Staff for International Affairs and Presidential Spokesman 
for President Susilo Bambangulona, a job he held since 2004, making him the longest serving presidential spokesman in the nation's modern history. Prior to that, he was the Foreign Affairs Department's Director for North American Affairs, and before that, local counsel here in Washington when I first came to know him. Uh, one thing, well, Dino also comes from a diplomatic family, as some of you I'm sure knows. His, his father, Ambassador Hashim Jalal, is the region's and one of the world's foremost experts on the South China Sea, which, which um, is something that, that um, is cause for me to read his work on a regular basis and, and, and so on. Uh, one thing I did not know about Dino, after all these years, it's a wonder what someone can learn from a website titled www.dinopatitomal.com. <laughs> I did know Dino was exposed in the early age to Indonesia's unique Islamic education system. He attended Muhammadiyah Elementary School and al -Azhar Junior High. He graduated from a high school much closer to home, in fact, very close to my home, McLean High School. At the age of 15, he obtained his bachelor's degree in political science from Carleton University and got his master's degree in political science from Simon Fraser University, both of those institutions in Canada. I assume you were accompanied with my father. Um, in 2000, Ambassador Jalal received a doctorate degree from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Dino has been named one of the world's 500 mo most influential Muslims. He's been a youth leader, and a film producer, and author of five books, including Haros Bisa, or the English copy, uh, The Can Do Leadership, which is a collection of political stories and leadership lessons from the SBI presidency. Uh, a book that is now is used in foreign ministry training and education system, we are using the police and the DNI as well. Uh, Dino has three children, and his wife Rosa, who is here with him today, is a former Miss Indonesia runner-up, and a dentist. <laughs> um, I could go on, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get any worse, I tell you that. <laughs> with that, let me turn it over to Dino and let him, uh, let him just talk to us. Walter, Bowman, David Merrill, Jim, oh, Well, thank you for your very kind and progressive comments. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, this morning, somebody was asking why I'm wearing a purple tie. You know? And my, my daughter, six-year-old daughter, was insisting on it the whole morning. Dad, you gotta wear this tie. You wear a purple tie. I was wearing white the whole time. You know? and then, after I left, uh, I asked them, why? Why are you insisting on it? You know, I don't, I've never worn a purple tie. And she says, it's because it's the favorite color of Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> now, if any of you know who this ja Justin Bieber chat or his parents, please let me know, because I'd like to find out who this guy is. <laughs> Look, uh, 21st century. 21st century has been called many things. The emerging market century, the Asian century, the global century, the post-human century, I don't exactly know what that means. Fareed Zakaria calls it the post-American era. Maybe it's a bit too late to put a label on it. But what is clear is that the 21st century will be very different than the 20th century. You know, they talk about revolution in the 20th century. Now they talk about innovation. They were concerned about literacy worldwide in the 20th century. Now we're concerned about digital literacy. The G7, G7 was the center stage. Now we live in a G20 world as the world premier economic forum. Indonesia used to be called the third world. We didn't like it so much because, you know, it's as if there's <coughs> on class one, class two, and class three. And we didn't want to go class three. But now we call ourselves proudly the emerging economy. Our main concern in the 20th century was fighting for our independence, but now we live in a world of interdependence and we have to get used to it. Bipolarity was much the jargon when I went to school and also when I joined the foreign ministry, but now the jargon is about connectivity. So you look at all these issues and you realize that this is a brave new world where all our assumptions about how things work in the previous century are being challenged. The best thing that nations can do is to understand how the world is changing, you know, what time it is. Like, that's a very important question. And the worst thing you can do is to be completely impervious to it. And in some ways, this is a challenge that we see in some countries in the Middle East now, how governments can and should adjust and keep up with
evolving needs and aspirations of their people, and how also they can keep up with the changing world. I mean, we in Indonesia had our share of lessons in not being tuned in, tuned in to history's watch. Nationalism it was born in Europe in the 17th century. We didn't catch on until the early 20th century. 20 years it took us to realize what this force is. Uh, modernity, we didn't catch on again until early 20th century, even though it had been around in Europe and also in Latin America for some time. Uh, democracy, we didn't become democracy until the end of the 20th century, 1998 or 1999, and we're the last, one of the last countries in what is called the third wave of democracy uh, to, to join. So we know what it means to be left behind by history's watch. And it's not just Indonesia, it's every nation, you must decide what time it is and how you adjust today to it. Now my talk today is an attempt to decipher the 21st century, to identify some of its relevant trends and also maybe put up some ideas on how nations can cope with it. I have seven points to make. Let me begin with the first one. First, we are in the midst of some pretty big shifts. In Davos, they call it the new reality. Tom Broca recently in Denver called it the second big bang. Robert Zolli called it global rebalancing. George Soros calls it the new world order. The National Intelligence Council called it the transformed world. They call it what you want, but the world is rapidly changing and it continues to unravel as we speak. Now, the shifts are vertical and horizontal. Vertically, the world GDP now stands at about $60 trillion. Now, it will be $260 trillion in the next three decades. This is phenomenal because if you think about it, the first thousand years after Christ was born, global average income per capita remained the same. And between the year 1000 until about 1820, the global average rise of income per capita was only 50%. Right? So this rise in world GDP is quite phenomenal. World population has doubled in the last few decades. Life expectancy in the year 1000 was 24 years, but now the global average about 66 years and much higher in certain countries, including America. The middle class worldwide, according to the economists, for the first time in history has grown to half of the world population, loosely defined. The capital market in the last 30 years has grown 1,300%. Internet use is rising and soon the whole world will be wired. Half the world population has moved to urban areas now and this will climb to 60% of the world population by 2030. And the number of independent countries around the world has risen <coughs> by 400%. It was about 50 countries when the UN was first uh, established and now it's about 192 countries. Never before has there been so many countries in human history and the number of democracies is also at its highest. Uh, according to the Federal House, it's about 123 countries. So vertically, you know, we have major shifts across the world, around the world. And it's not just the quantity going on, you know, it's the, 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 the quality, the horizontal shifts, the relations of power structures, the power dynamics, which are fundamentally changing. One of the recent phenomena is what is called the emerging economies, the emerging powers. They have many names now. Uh, the BRIC, you have heard about it. The Brazil, Russia, India, China. There's something else called Greeks. Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, India, China, South Africa. Something else called E7. This is the BRICS plus Indonesia plus Mexico plus Turkey. Something called Tibet, uh, Colombia, <coughs> Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, Turkey, South Africa. And something else called Next 11, the N11. It's quite confusing all these acronyms, but the point is they point to a shift and the emergence of new uh, powers in the world. And the number of middle income economies will also grow. But what is uh, interesting is that what you will see, what you will expect to see among the emerging economies is closer relations. This is going to be the new diplomatic space to fill. You know, a while ago, uh, the the uh, trade about 10 years ago between emerging economies is something in the amount of $40 billion. But now when you see, uh, sorry, $72 billion, 
but as the numbers, uh, 10 years ago, the numbers have risen to about $380 billion uh, trade between emerging economies. This is something that's going to keep growing. And we will also see a trend whereby more countries will join not just the rank of emerging economies, but they will also join the ranks of middle income countries. Indonesia now is in the lower middle income country, it will rise up to the middle and upper middle income countries. So the movement is for these all to move up. You know, you will see a lot more power centers around the world. And Asia is seeing a renaissance. And we talk a lot about the rise of Asia, and this is something that you really feel in the region if you go there. By 2020, which is just another decade, 45% of global GDP will come from Asia, one-third of global trade. The population in Asia will grow to 7.7 .7 billion dollars, that's uh, right, 7.7 .7 billion people, and it will be home to the world's most dynamic economies and also hopefully democracy. So what? What is the significance of this? Well, the weight of the world now feels very different. Nations in the 21st century, you must see yourself not just where you are located in the world map, and you know, when you see the world physical map, you know where you are. America is big, imposing. Indonesia is also big in Southeast Asia. But more importantly, it's not where you place in the world map, but where you are in the global map. You know, uh, look at where America's rankings on um, competitiveness in that, on human development, on ease of doing business, on education, and so on and so on. Indonesia also, uh, less about how many islands we have, but what is our rankings in the human development index, in the economic freedom index, in the freedom index, and so on. So the nations will be forced to see themselves more in the global map than in the world map. And what this means also that in a crowded world with so many power centers, countries must learn to come to terms with one another. I say this because after World War II, America and also the Soviet Union could easily say, okay, the world must come to our terms, right? After the Cold War, there was a sense of that too, you know, America saying, capitalism won, free market democracy won, the world must come to our terms. This is when I heard rhetoric that America stood taller than others, so we could see farther with the, the, the indispensable nations, and so on and so on. But it's a different feel to it, you know? So many different centers say, no, you come towards us and we meet you halfway, you know? So this is what you see now, a process whereby everybody, including superpower, rich America, must come to terms with everybody else. And you will see also more countries are sensitive, becoming increasingly sensitive about the notion of equality. Okay? Uh, in the comprehensive partnership that we have with the United States, uh, in the, the statement, that term of equal partnership is there. Right? But this is not just Indonesia. <coughs> Many countries, big and small, medium and big, medium and small, when they deal with another, there's going to be a growing sense of need of equality. And this is going to be the world that we're going to be facing. And it also means that we're in a process of finding a new equilibrium. Right? Uh, new countries are coming to the fore. Countries are rising in economic, and diplomatic, and strategic, and political power. Where's the new balance going to be? Uh, we're trying to find out the answer to this in the Asia Pacific. It's still an ongoing and evolving question. But whatever it is, whatever the result, this is going to be a delicate process that will require lots of diplomatic skill. The second thing I want to say, partnerships is, there's a phenomenal growth of partnerships around the world. Now, if you look at the diplomatic space in the Asia Pacific, you see something phenomenal is happening. Let's just look at Indonesia, for example. This is Indonesia with all the countries. And the red means that in the past, we've had bad relations with them. You know, with Australia, we had strained relations. With Netherlands, there were, we had colonial wars with China, there were ad adversary. In the US, we had adversarial relations in the United States, the UK also. With Malaysia and Singapore, there were policies of confrontasi. Uh, with Portugal and with Japan also, we, we had uh, uh, a difficult past, right? And look at what happens now in the present, Indonesia today. With Australia, we have a comprehensive partnership. With the United States also. With China, it's a strategic partnership. With the Netherlands, we have very good bilateral relations. With Malaysia and Singapore, we fellow ASEAN members have very good bilateral relations. With Japan, we have a 21st century partnership, and so on and so on. This is just in a time frame of about two or three decades. Our relationship has been completely turned 
uh, upside down. And the incredible thing is that it's not just Indonesia, you know. Around the region, you see, this is a very interesting box. Uh, it's not uh, meticulously researched, but I think you get the idea. These are all the countries uh, in the Asia Pacific, you know, Australia, Brunei Darussalam, Cambodia is alphabetically ordered uh, uh, X and Y, uh, vertically and horizontally. And then you look at the boxes, much of the boxes would be empty uh, about four or five decades ago, right? Um, but uh, most of the boxes would be filled with a line, you know, the, the green, yeah? But now, if you put these boxes into categories, uh, what countries have security relations with one another, strategic partnerships, uh, defense cooperation, and so on, or other types of partnerships. It can be just diplomatic or economic partnerships. You see the boxes are still now. You know, one of the countries that are still empty is uh, DPRK uh, over there. And Mongolia is uh, growing. I think I should, uh, that, that box, that row should be uh, uh, updated. But you see such a crowded network of partnerships across the board, bilaterally. Right? Now let's move to the regionally. This is the region, uh, and you see at the bottom, uh, going down, are the list of countries, and to the right are regional organizations, ASEAN, Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, ASEAN Regional Forum, APEC, uh, East Asia Summit, uh, uh, Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, and so on and so on. And again, four or five decades ago, many of these boxes would be empty. In fact, the rows would not be there at all, but now you see a proliferation of networks, countries joining uh, regional arrangements.